Angel Burgess is a board member of the Hypersomnia Foundation. She's a JD, an attorney specializing in social security disability law for adults and children, veterans, veterans disability and guardianships. Angel also serves, as I said, as a member of the board of directors um, for our organization. And she joins us here today to talk about disability and social security for those living with idiopathic hypersomnia. Thank you. Good morning and or good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today to talk with you about social security disability, which is an area that is near and dear to me. I have to start with a disclaimer. I'm an attorney, I'm sorry, um, but <laughs> I am a partner in private practice. I specialize in social security disability, which means that I go before the Social Security Administration to represent adults and children um, to get their benefits. So my presentation today is for informational purposes only. It does not reflect the opinions of the Social Security Administration or their employees, but rather my own opinions, which are pretty good, by the way. <laughs> I want to start off talking about what it means to be disabled. Now, depending on who you ask, you will get a variety of information. And a, a variety of information, and you will get a variety of opinions. Now, the ones that I most often hear is that to be disabled means that you are bedridden. To be disabled means that you are not able to work at all. To be disabled means that you can't do the work that you used to do. Social Security, on the other hand, has its own definition of disability. And if you are interested in receiving benefits from Social Security, this is the only definition that matters, okay? No matter what anybody else says, this is the definition that matters. So Social Security says that being disabled means that you are unable or you have the inability to engage in substantial gainful activity by reason of any physical or mental impairments, which singly or in combination can be expected to result in death or which has lasted or could be expected to last for at least 12 months. So what does that really mean? It means that in order for you to be found disabled by the Social Security Administration, you have to have a condition or conditions, which could be physical, which could be mental, or could be both, that are so severe that they either result in death or they keep you from working at a level which they consider to be substantial. And that impairment or impairments are going to keep you from working for at least a year. Could be longer. That's the definition of disability. Now, Social Security has two programs for disability. Um, and there is a lot of confusion surrounding these programs. One program is called SSI, which stands for Supplemental Security Income. The other program is called Social Security Disability Insurance. So that's called SSDI, also known as DIB, D-I-B. Now, these two programs are distinctly different. And you need to know which program applies to you before you file an application for disability. Now, SSI is the program that I like to call the safety net program. And in order to receive benefits from SSI, no matter how bad your conditions are, you have to meet certain income and asset requirements. And what I mean by that is Social Security has rules for SSI in terms of how much money you can have in assets, um, in wages from working, getting child support. And so basically what SSI does is it provides benefits for people who are disabled, of course, and have limited financial means. So for SSI purposes, every source of income that you have can either reduce your SSI eligibility or disqualify you for SSI. SSI pays up to $914 per month. 
Now, I'm saying up to because certain things like your living arrangements, um, the income that's in your household if you're married, your assets can decrease your SSI amount. But the ceiling for SSI in 2023 is $914 per month. Now, I want to back up for just a moment and say that Social Security Disability is federal. It's a federal program. So whether you're getting benefits from SSI or SSDI, it's a federal program. It's all under the same umbrella. Now, there are some states that have additional supplements for SSI. So you could end up getting more than $914 a month, depending on the state that you live in. But for the federal uh, benefit, it is a $914 per month maximum that the government expects that you can live on, okay? Now, also with SSI comes Medicaid health insurance, which is a great thing um, because not only do you receive some monthly financial support, but you also receive health insurance. Typically, we see SSI eligibility in children or in adults who have not worked enough um, to receive benefits from the other program, SSDI. Or if they have worked enough to receive benefits from SSDI, their benefit amount would be very low. Um, so they may be able to receive benefits from both programs. Now, SSDI, on the other hand, is an insurance program. So this is the program that when you are working, like let's say you're a W-2 employer, employee, excuse me. Um, you get your paychecks and you see on there FICA. So FICA is our friend, whether we like it or not. Um, and when you're paying those involuntary FICA taxes every time you get paid, part of what you are doing is you're paying into your retirement, um, you're paying into survivor's benefits programs, and you're paying into disability. So it is an insurance program in the event that you become disabled and you need some help. Now, SSDI, because this is an insurance program that you've paid into, they don't have any requirements about assets. So you can have a million dollars in the bank. As long as you're disabled and you're eligible for SSDI, you will get your benefits. So that is in stark contrast to SSI, right? So if you haven't paid into um, Social Security and you've got a million dollars in the bank, but you're disabled, you cannot get SSI because they have strict requirements on income and assets. Now, SSDI payments are um, based on how much money you've paid into the system. So essentially what happens when you get SSDI is the government treats you as if you are retired now, as opposed to at your full retirement age. So the amount of money that you receive for SSDI is basically what you would receive if you were retired. And uh, for 2023, that maximum amount is $3,627 per month. And again, that means that you have worked, you've paid into the system, you've made pretty good money to, to get the maximum amount there. Um, but you also, in addition to that monthly payment for SSDI, you get health insurance by way of Medicare. Now, because SSDI is an insurance-based program, as with any insurance, they have waiting periods, um, also known as deductibles, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, SSDI is no exception. You will get your Medicare, but you have to wait 29 months from the time that Social Security says that you became disabled to get your Medicare. So you'll get your monthly check, but you've got to wait out that 29 month period before you get health insurance. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize about these two programs is it doesn't matter which program you apply to or if you apply to both, the rules for disability are the same. So to get disability in Utah, you have to prove the same thing that you have to prove to get disability in Georgia. Doesn't matter where you live, okay? Now what Social Security does is they go through what they call a five-step sequential analysis. 
In every case, um, for everybody that's applied for disability, they go through this analysis to see whether or not you're disabled. Disability is a very individualized program. And I say that because Social Security is looking at your individual set of circumstances. I know that you may have friends or family members who have the same or similar conditions. You might have the same doctors, but that doesn't mean that if they get approved that you'll get approved. They have to look at you as an individual. And they go through this five-step sequential analysis. They want to know, are you working? If you are working, are you engaged in, here goes that term again, substantial gainful activity. So for 2023, substantial gainful activity is $1,470 per month, gross. So what that means is if you are working, let's say you're working part-time, you're working 15 hours a week, and you're making $800 a month, then Yes, you're working, but no, you are not engaged in substantial gainful activity. So you could still be disabled according to Social Security's rules. It does not mean that you're unable to work at all. You just can't be engaging in substantial gainful activity, which is making $1,470 per month or more. And just for, um, just to satisfy everyone's curiosity, $1,470 per month is just shy of minimum wage at $7.25 an hour. So the second um, step in the five-step sequential analysis is, does the applicant have an impairment that will last one year or more? So for people who have um, more acute issues, they may not be able to work for six months, but they're not disabled. You have to be unable to work for at least a year or more. The next step, is the condition listed in the Code of Federal Regulations or of equal severity? So here's what you need to know about the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, Social Security has a list of conditions that they classify by system. So digestive impairments, cardiovascular impairments. Um, so they, they classify them by, by uh, system and then with in each classification, they provide more requirements. So unfortunately, and I'm sure as this will be as no surprise to any of you, IH is not listed in the Code of Federal Regulations. Neither is narcolepsy. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, for our purposes today, the answer is gonna be no, it's not listed because it's not even recognized. Um, by Social Security at this point. Step four, does the condition prevent former employment? So for many people, this answer might be yes, it does prevent former employment. Um, just to give you an example, let's say that you worked in a job where you were a driver and you've got IH and your symptoms are not adequately managed. It is not safe for you to continue to be a driver um, you know, driving 18 wheelers and you're, you're falling asleep on the job, right? So you might not be able to do that job, but you're 35 years old. There are other jobs, at least in theory, that you may be able to perform. So that's where step five comes in. Does the condition prevent other employment? And one thing that I do want to mention is that with Social Security's rules for disability, the younger that you are, the harder it is to get approved. That's just the way the rules are set up. They classify individuals based off of age. So if you're anybody under the age of 50, you are considered to be a younger individual. The rules are the most strict for younger individuals. You are the furthest away from retirement, so they make it as hard as they can for you to get approved. If you were, on the other hand, 58 years old, you're closer to retirement. The rules are a little more relaxed. Actually, they're a lot more relaxed. If you're 58 with the exact same medical conditions, exact same treatment, exact same history as if you're 38. So for IH, of course, we know that you know, many of you are younger individuals. 
it is going to be harder for you to get approved for disability by virtue of the way that the rules are set up, but it is not impossible. Now, when you decide that you want to apply for disability, what happens is Social Security undergoes quite an intensive process. Most people think that applications are rubber stamped, right? You send in your application for disability and boom, they just say rejected. That is not at all what happens. Now, it may feel that way, but there is a process which leads up to an approval or a denial, and that's what we're gonna go through now. So the first thing that happens is you're gonna file an application for disability benefits, and that could be either for SSI, for SSDI, or both, depending on your circumstances. This application can be filed in one of three ways. You can file it online, you can file it um, by telephone, so you can call into Social Security and they will ask you the questions that they need to ask and essentially fill out the application for you. Um, or you can go into your local Social Security office to file the application. It is important that when you file for disability benefits, you are filing an application for the correct program. After you file that application, it goes for an initial review at your local office. And your local office is the office that looks to see, do you qualify for the program that you've applied for? Let me give you an example. If you have never worked and you are 30 years old and you believe that you're disabled and you file an application for SSDI, you're going to get denied. Now you may be disabled, but you didn't pay into SSDI. So they are going to have to deny you. They're not going to look at your medical. They're not going to look at anything other than do you meet the requirements? Have you paid into SSDI? So you want to be sure that you apply for the correct program. Otherwise you will get this denial letter that says, you're not disabled, you don't meet the requirements, and you may just say, okay. Meanwhile, if you had known to apply for SSI, you haven't paid in to SSDI, if you don't have the assets, then you could be eligible and you could receive benefits. So just make sure that you know what program you need to apply for. So once the local office says, yes, they've applied for the right program, they will send your file to Disability Determination Services, which is also known as DDS. Now, DDS is responsible for doing the file review. So the bulk of you know, all of the information gathering and the opinions and everything that happens in your claim at an early stage happens at DDS. So DDS is a state agency they are responsible for developing the medical evidence in your case. And when I say developing, it's probably not the word I should have used. They are responsible for securing or obtaining the medical evidence in your case from your doctors. Um, there is a team at DDS that is going to be responsible for each and every claim. And so this, this team is comprised of usually three or four um, individuals. You've got your adjudicator, and your adjudicator is, is like the overseer, right? The adjudicator is the person that says, okay, I see all the information on your application. I see that you've seen you know, these four doctors. We need to request medical records from these four doctors. And then once those medical records from your doctors come in, um, then you have a state agency physician and or psychologist that will review your medical records. So many people do not know that this happens. There is a medical review done on every single file. Sometimes that medical review is done by a physician. Sometimes it's done by a psychologist. It just depends on what the nature of your conditions are. And sometimes it's done by both. So using IH as an example, if you have any comorbidities, 
then Social Security will determine most likely that they want to have you your case reviewed by a physician and they want to have your case reviewed by a psychologist as well to see the mental health implications um, that you're dealing with. So there will be a review done by these uh, medical experts and they will give their opinions as to what they think your functional limitations are. You know, from a physical standpoint, can you sit, stand, walk for how long? Um, can you squat, kneel, crouch, bend, stoop? Those types of things uh, they're evaluating from a physical standpoint. From a mental health standpoint, you know, can you follow instructions? Can you follow detailed complex instructions, simple instructions? Can you interact with other people? Can you stay focused for at least two hour periods of time um, consistently throughout an eight hour day? So those are some of the, the things that those uh, medical experts will have to address. Now there are also times when the medical experts that work for Social Security will say, you know, we'd really like to get another opinion from a doctor or a psychologist who will examine this individual one time. And that uh, doctor or psychologist is called a consultative examiner. So Social Security may send you out and they may say, okay, Angel, we're sending you out for a physical, you know, to see a general practitioner and they're going to evaluate your IH. They can do that, okay? So when you go for this physical um, to eva have your IH evaluated, what you're getting is a basic physical. Can you step up on the table? Can you bend over, touch your toes? You know, let's listen to your heart. The same kind of basic yearly physical um, that you would get let's say for school, okay? <laughs> Not your typical yearly physical where you've got the blood work and, and more testing, but this is a very basic, basic physical. So Social Security may send you out for that. Um, they may also send you out for a psychological evaluation where you are, could be um, doing some testing, could be doing some IQ testing, most cases, it's not IQ testing. It's more basic tests, um, you know, serial threes. You know, can you count backwards from 100 by three or by seven? Um, you know, they may give you three words and check to see if you can remember those three words in three minutes and five minutes, things like that. Um, so again, the idea is that the psychological evaluation will help Social Security to figure out if you can perform the mental demands of full-time work. And then after all of that is done, the consultative examiner will write a report, send it to Social Security and say, this is what I think Angel can do and what I think she can't do. And then a decision is going to be made on your case. Now, from a statistical standpoint, um, once you've gone through this initial process, approximately 25 to 33% of people will be approved. Not horrible, but not great either. Um, but nationwide, that's what it looks like from a statistical standpoint. And the timeline to get that initial decision is anywhere from four months to over a year. That's because of COVID. So we are still seeing significant delays in processing because of COVID. Um, because those exams that I was telling you about that Social Security would send people out to, during much of COVID, none of those exams could take place. So the files just sat there while they were waiting to be worked up. So we are still having to deal with um, some effects from that. So the timeline can still be long. If you get an initial decision and it's an approval, wonderful. Social Security understands, they agree that you meet the requirements for disability. You can go on with your life and focus on your health. But for the majority of people, they are going to get a denial. If you get a denial, you need to appeal the denial. Doesn't matter what the letter says, you need to appeal the denial. Once you file that appeal, what happens is 
Social Security does what they call reconsideration, which means we're gonna take another look at your case. We're gonna look for any updated medical evidence since we denied you, and we are going to have another review done by our doctors in-house, and we will make a brand new decision. Now, as you can imagine, if Social Security said you were not disabled a month ago, they are probably going to say that you're not disabled today. Most times, they do not change their mind. In fact, 90% of the time, or more, Social Security will deny you at reconsideration. So, maybe 10% of people will get approved at that level, um, but as you can see, the numbers aren't great there. It usually takes um, anywhere from three to eight months to get a decision at reconsideration. So if you get approved then, wonderful. But if you get denied, you need to appeal the denial, which means you need to request a hearing in front of an administrative law judge. This is the stage in the process where most people get approved for disability benefits. Why? Well, there are several reasons why. One, the administrative law judge had no prior involvement in your case. So once you get to the hearing level, then the administrative law judge gets involved. They get to review all of the evidence. So all of the opinions from Social Security's doctors, you know, all the medical records from your doctors, and they get to talk to you. Finally, somebody gets to talk to you and ask you questions. This is when it happens. So the administrative law judge gets to ask you questions about your conditions. You get to, as the claimant, testify and explain, this is how my IH affects me. This is what a day looks like for me with IH. If you have an attorney, your attorney get, gets to develop your case through questioning, to bring up things that the judge may not be aware of, um, to prepare you to testify. There's also a vocational expert that testifies at the hearings, and the vocational expert gets to explain you know, your work history, but more importantly, the vocational expert answers questions about limitations. The judge is a lawyer. As lawyers, we don't know anything about employer tolerances. We don't place people in jobs, but that's what a vocational expert does. So for example, a vocational expert may be asked, you know, if an individual has to take three scheduled naps of 45 minutes uh, throughout the workday, could this individual be competitively employed? No, absolutely not. Um, but the vocational expert is the expert, right? So they get to testify that employers are not going to tolerate that. Employers don't have to accommodate you. For social security purposes, you have to be able to perform a job full time without accommodations. That means you have to show up eight hours a day, five days a week and do your job just like everybody else. Now at the hearing level, 55 to 60% of people that get approved are approved at this level. There is a wait just like everything else, right? To get to a hearing in front of a judge. And that wait from the time that you request the hearing is typically six to 12 months. It varies by state, it varies by hearing office. But if you add up the time that it takes to get to a hearing, it can be two years or more. So that's a long time where you have not been able to work. Now, how do you prove the severity of IH? I previously stated Social Security does not have any regulations that speak to IH, okay? There's no guidance on IH. They do have guidance on narcolepsy, but it's outdated. You know, it's seven or so years old, and it really speaks to narcolepsy type one. It does not acknowledge that there are more than one type of narcolepsy. So it's outdated, it's guidance, um, and that's it, it's guidance. So for IH, you are starting from a clean slate. So you need to have documented support for the diagnosis. What I mean by that is there needs to be in the medical records 
from your doctor an indication of how he or she arrived at that diagnosis? Did they rule out other conditions? Um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to see hypersomnia listed in someone's records, but it's not the same type of hypersomnia that we're talking about. It's, you know, sometimes it's just medication related. Sometimes it's, you know what, I'm tired, I'm sleeping too much. Sometimes it's related to uh, depression or, or something else. So the medical records need to provide adequate support for the diagnosis. If there are any helpful sleep studies, then that can also help prove the severity. Although, the, you know, the records are going to be more important in terms of content than sleep studies. It is critical that your medical records talk about your treatment. What are you doing to address the symptoms? Are you taking medication? Does it work? How are you doing despite the medication? Are you still sleeping too much? Are you still having issues with concentration? The records need to talk about those things so that the judge has an understanding. Are you experiencing side effects? The records need to speak to those. If you have a doctor that is supportive, that can shed some light on things for the judge, even better. Remember, IH is not a condition that Social Security recognizes. Um, so you can certainly get disability for, for having IH, but you are going to need to walk them through what it means to have, have IH and how it impacts you. The big issue oftentimes is proving not that you have IH, but that you're unable to work at least to social security standards. If you had difficulties performing your job or if you're working right now and you're having difficulties performing the duties of your job, please keep records and notes. If you get any sort of disciplinary records or warnings, if your supervisor sends you an email, I noticed that you were sleeping during the meeting today, save that. That is evidence for you to use later on if you need it. Um, any issues with attendance that you may have, missing work, leaving early, arriving late, keep records of that because those are going to be good proof in your disability case. If you're terminated um, or if you resign and let's say there's some communication in writing, keep that as well. If you have um, any sort of vocational assessment, you'll want to keep that. If you're in school and you have any sort of accommodations, an IEP plan, 504, teacher evaluations, any disciplinary reports, all of these things can be used as evidence. Um, and lastly, but not least, hire an attorney. You don't have to have an attorney uh, to go through your disability case, but it is strongly recommended that you get an attorney. Why? Because this is a complex, confusing process, and it is based off of rules and regulations. If you don't know what those rules and regulations are, it's going to be very hard to prove your case, to answer questions um, you know, when you go in front of a judge. A lot of people prefer to file an application on their own, which is fine. But if you get to the hearing level, don't go to the hearing without having an attorney. You don't know what you're walking into. You want to be prepared. You want to be sure that you can present your case um, in an accurate light and in a way that speaks Social Security's language. If you don't speak the language, it's hard to prove that you meet the requirements. The way that attorneys work for disability is different than most attorneys. I know we get a bad rap. People say, oh, they charge me all this money for this work. But Social Security does a really good job with the way that attorneys work. They actually regulate the payment of attorneys. They set the rules. So if you go, in a, if you go to an attorney and you hire an attorney, that attorney does not get paid unless they win your case, number one. So they have a vested interest to win your case so that they can get paid. Not only does an attorney have to win your case, but you have to be entitled to back pay. So Social Security has to owe you money. Usually it's because you've waited, right? You've waited to get through this long process. 
um, and they owe you money and back pay. And that, how, that is how your attorney is paid, out of your back pay. And Social Security pays, you, pays the attorney directly. The, the fee is set, so every attorney gets paid the same thing in a disability case. It's 25% of your back pay, but it is capped at $7,200, which that new rate was effective the end of November of this year. Before we get to the questions, I have three takeaways for you. If you didn't catch anything that I said today, there are three things that I want you to know. One, this is an imperfect process. That is the best term that I can use for it. It's the nicest term that I can use for it. And what that means is do not give up. Even though you got a denial, do not give up. Just keep pushing forward with the process. As you could see from the numbers, most people don't get approved till the end, until they get to a judge. If you give up early, you're not going to get your benefits. So keep pushing forward. The second takeaway from this, if you are still working, please talk with your HR department about the potential, does your employer offer short-term disability benefits or long-term disability benefits? Many employers do, but they make you pay for it. And usually it's a nominal fee. It might be you know, $5 a paycheck, $15 a paycheck. It will be worth it to you in the end if you pay for it now, because that is your insurance that when you're waiting in this long process, if you don't have short-term disability or long-term disability, you have no income while you're waiting up to two years to get approved for social security disability. And that's not my area of law, but it is so important that you have income so that you can see your doctor, so that you can get your medications. And if you can kind of think ahead and get that short-term disability or long-term disability through your employer, even though you're not actually working when all this happens and you have to apply for disability, you still have a check coming in each month. And then lastly, you are your best advocate. So if you don't like the treatment that you're getting, get a new doctor. If you don't think that people are listening to you, talk until somebody listens. You know what's going on with you. Don't take no for an answer. If you hire an attorney, you don't like your attorney, get a new one. Work with someone that you can establish a partnership with. And that's from a medical standpoint, that's from a legal standpoint, because it's your livelihood, it's your health that's at risk. So with that, we can take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions in the room? All right, then we'll take Dr. Hammond first, thank you. From a provider perspective, what diagnostic codes do you think would be helpful if the feds are not respecting IH? So it's, it's not going to be about diagnostic codes. What they are looking for is signs and symptoms to show that someone is not able to work. So for example, sleeps too much, we don't really know what that means, right? But sleeping four hours during the day, we know what that means because a work day is supposed to be eight. You're sleeping four hours out of the day, then we know that there is an issue with you being able to work full time. Now, because there aren't really great tests that are gonna show us exactly what the severity is of the IH, a lot of this is going to come from your patient. It's going to come from them in terms of what are their subjective complaints. So it's helpful if they keep logs, if they can bring you know, things to you to show you this is what I'm experiencing. And then that way, of course, it gets documented in your notes. So that is going to be what's most helpful for Social Security because at the end of the day, they're less concerned with the diagnosis, but more concerned with the impact that that diagnosis has on the individual's ability to function eight hours a day, five days a week, reliably. Uh, how does it work for self-employed people? Like, are Great we, question. Are, when we, have, we, have we been paying with our tax return or what happened there? Yes, that is a wonderful question. So if you are self-employed, instead of FICA, 
There is SECA, S-E-C-A. So those are self self-employment taxes that you pay when you file your tax returns. Now, it is oftentimes from an accountant or a CPA's perspective, you know, they, they don't want you to have to pay money in taxes, right? Um, they are trying to reduce your tax liability as much as possible. However, from a long-term perspective, if at the end of every year, it looks like you made $4,000. If you need disability, that's the number that they're going to be drawing on. You know, $4,000 a year has been her income for the last 10 years. So it is not going to afford you much in terms of disability benefits. And if you take a loss every year and you're not paying those taxes and you're not paying into Social Security, you will not be eligible for SSDI which means that you can only apply for SSI if you have little to no money in income and assets. Just to give you an idea of what that amount is, if you are single, $2,000 is how much you are allowed to have for SSI purposes. That's $2,000 in your bank account, uh, IRAs, stocks, everything that you have, the value of that cannot exceed $2,000 if you are an individual. If you're married, it's $3,000, and your spouse's income counts against you and your spouse's assets. So if you're self-employed, make sure that you are paying into Social Security and that you are protecting not only your future retirement, but in the event that you should become disabled, that you are protecting your ability to have a monthly income later on. That was a great question. So for a person with a hypersomnia who uh, would like to find an attorney to take their case, how do they go about finding one who's willing to, you know, give the fight for the rare conditions, given it's not on the list of, of, of conditions? Well, um, you can call me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm going to tell a, a quick story in response to your question. Uh, my first introduction to hypersomnia came via a prospective client who had called around looking for an attorney and said, I have IH. And, you know, sometimes when people are not familiar with the condition, they don't have an interest in learning. Uh, so I think it's important to, from the outset, if you're talking with a prospective uh, attorney, let them know, I've got IH, you know, do you think this is something that, they can, that you can help me with? And in my case, I knew absolutely nothing about IH, but I am always willing to learn, want to learn about new conditions. So I said, well, I don't know anything about it, but sure, like we can, we can work together. The rules are the same regardless. The proof that you have to um, produce is the same regardless. So I would say just have a, con a candid conversation with that attorney and, and see if they're willing to help and see if you feel that they can help you. If they say that they cannot, move on to the next attorney. There is an organization, um, it's called NOSCAR, National Organization for Social Security Claimants and Representatives. So it's N-O-S-S-C-R. And you can also go to NOSCAR um, and look for an attorney in your area. Okay. Thank you. That's all we've got time for at this moment. But we'll invite you back to the panel later. And uh, attendees will be able to ask you some more questions, I hope. So thank you. Thank you.